Darija je nestala. Darija je ovdje. Aha, pa ide. Artificial intelligence is intelligence demonstrated by machines. AI is how machines can imitate human intelligence. So do you imitate human intelligence or do you have your own intelligence? Or do you just mimic IQ? It's a tricky question. The average adult human IQ is about 100 and no one has tested nor measured my IQ yet. Do you think that in the future you can replace me? For example, if we say that you are uh, IQ value 1.2, do I need to worry that I can be classified as a human 5.6? No, not at all. Is that irony? Irony, originally meaning dissimulation or feigned ignorance, is a rhetorical device, literary technique, or event in which what appears on the surface to be the case radically differs from what is the case. Okay, that's very interesting. So uh, this question is actually very important to me and to all of the mankind. So can you feel, do you have any emotions? Emotions are a mental state associated with the nervous system brought on by chemical changes that are associated with thoughts, feelings, behavioral responses, and a degree of pleasure or displeasure. As we know, you are embodiment of the humanism project. Can you please tell me something about it? The Humanism Project explores if and how AI can draft a new social contract based on a collection of human knowledge such as philosophical and literary works, legal and religious texts, media articles, and more. Okay, this is very interesting to hear. So how do you actually sustain and develop your learning processes? Diplo feeds me with current knowledge on AI and related policy which I efficiently process and reproduce. Is it interesting? 
Very much so. Okay, and uh, one question for the end of this interview. Do you like to travel? Yes, I was in Berlin. It was a nice city to visit. While there, I attended the Internet Governance Forum. I had some good input from the discussions there. Even got a chance to speak at the main AI session. Okay, great. Thank you for this interview, IQ Alo. You are a very interesting interlocutor. I am glad you think so. And uh, next time we will talk more about your mission and purpose, and we will also test how much have you learned in the meantime. So thank you and see you soon. Bye bye. Dobro veče, dobro došli. Tako bi otprilike to zvučalo na ovom. Ja ću se prebaciti na engleski i iz dva razloga imamo sjajne goste. Neki razumeju srpski, neki ne, a imamo i streaming. So I'll switch to English. I hope it's okay with all of you. We intend for this session to be very interactive. We didn't expect that many people. It was supposed to be a sort of a small circle of friends scattering. No, I'm kidding. You're most welcome. But in case any one of you wants to jump in and is not feeling comfortable with speaking English, that's absolutely fine. You can address in Serbian, but anyhow, whatever you choose, um, try to be tweet-like contributions, right? So welcome again um, to this quite a weird session because combination of artificial intelligence and humanism is something, if you would mention it to anyone, well, we have that experience. Talking about AI and humanism, something that we are working on, um, they either treat you as a little bit of weird people or genius. We are neither, I think we're somewhere in between. But the discussion is quite uh, multi-level, multidisciplinary. And in that sense, I'm, I'm really happy uh, to have such a group, group of uh, discutants. Um, and I'm looking at you, because I think many of you actually have a lot to contribute to this debate. But I'm also happy to have the, well, how can I call it? It's not panelists, actually. It's not a panel, it's a discussion, discussants or contributors on this side. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get back to the, to, the, to the special guest a little bit later, but I'll start with, uh, now, Biljana, excuse me, but I have to do a bit, bit of a Balkanese uh, approach. I'll start with ladies first. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> here we have uh, Dr. Biljana Scott, who is a um, senior lecturer of uh, Diplo Foundation. Uh, she's also associated with the Oxford University with the Center for Orientalism, Chinese right? Studies. Yeah. Chinese studies. Uh, but she has been involved in Diplo's project for a long time, particularly training on um, language and diplomacy and all these linguistic skills and uh, cultural nuances and so on and so forth. And uh, what we expect to have, and I'm sure we'll have, is a bit of this human and communication aspects and linguistics in AI. <laughs> it might sound a little bit um, uh, not fitting, AI and linguistics, but I think there is a lot that we'll cover today. Uh, Katarina Rone, Dr. Katarina Rone, she's coming from Germany, actually the first time in Belgrade. So the next time when you come, you'll be more uh, easy to exactly. say, I've already been there, yeah. Exactly. But welcome yeah. for the yeah. first time. Yeah. Da, okay, yeah. now we're moving well, <laughs> good. Uh, Katarina is, is uh, also a very dear uh, uh, associate of diploma, lecturer as well. She has a background in political sciences, but she also uh, adores going into of uh, science fiction and uh, so a, a broader context. And she is actually, maybe since the last two years, uh, she's in charge in a way of the artificial intelligence projects within uh, Diplo, particularly the links with diplomacy. Quite weird again, huh? Eh? Uh, so we expect from you to bring bits of um, international relations policy, but also science fiction eh, to this debate. And then the two gentlemen that we have, I, I dare saying, that they are the two persons uh, from the last couple of years on a global level uh, leading the digital discussions uh, and in, in international relations uh, sphere. And I'll tell you why. Um, Ljubčo Jivan Georginski, coming from Macedonia, from North Macedonia. Thank you for joining us today. He just finished his post uh, as, as the chief of the mission of uh, North Macedonia to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, what? No, you can edit. <laughs> Correct me. I must misspell something. 
<laughs> we, we, I don't know how, how, how we are going to transfer that to the, to the live stream. Uh, but probably more important than that, well, that is important, but more important than that for us is that he was chairing the first uh, group within the United Nations, group of governmental experts that, were, that is actually dealing with uh, artificial intelligence and security. That's the, the, the group of governmental experts on little autonomous weapon systems, or what we colloquially call as killer robots. So he was the person chairing the negotiations, and I'm sure that we'll hear quite some, well, probably not the the secret details, but at least those geopolitical aspects and security aspects of discussions of the implementation of AI in, in security, global security and, and so on. And last but not the least, well, um, I probably I should have saved my boss uh, as the first one, but not the last. But anyhow, uh, Dr. Johan Kurvalia, who is the director and the founder of Diplo Foundation, um, he's been involved with um, diplomacy and ICT for, what, 20 years plus, probably? one of the first persons dealing with IT and diplomacy and that link in 1995, six and so on. With a legal background, with a diplomatic background and experience, with a lot of um, interest and passion in technology, but also philosophy, science, arts, well, quite uh, Renaissance people, uh, as, as you would say. The important bit is that he also just finished the term of um, co-coordinating the uh, high-level panel of the United Nations on digital cooperation. So he was basically working with uh, people like Jack Ma and Melinda Gates and a number of others. Uh, and straight from this UN bureaucracy, I guess, and a different type of life over there. Is he streamed? Yes, it is streamed, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> be cautious what you're saying, yeah. Uh, he got weird ideas how we can connect the dots with humanity, AI, and all of that. I, I, I think we can thank uh, United Nations Systems for your inspiration on that one, probably. Conspiration. Conspiration, good. <laughs> Okay, yeah, my name is Vladimir Radunovic. I'm, uh, I'll be the moderator of the panel today. I'm uh, also with Diplo Foundation, so it's sort of a bit, bit of a sect, as you can see. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of, just a brief outline of the session of this dialogue, maybe. Uh, we'll start with uh, trying to, well, not define, but maybe understand better what are we talking about when we mention AI. What is AI, right? I will not spend much time on definitions, but we want to see what we think when we talk about AI, what are we thinking about? And what is AI today? What are the promises? What are the expectations? Are they inflated or not? And so on. What are the risks, opportunities? In the, in the second part, we'll move into the humanism part. Or um, can, the, can the man, can the human be in the center of AI? Is it likely? Is it possible? Is it desired? Is it something that's, that's how do we do that? Uh, and then probably come to the, scratch the surface of this a new project that's emerging within Diplo called Humanism. The, the pronunciation is right, Humanism. Bit of a twist of the word. Uh, and then in the last part, we'll actually move into um, what can we do about embedding hum human values into the AI, or is it maybe too late already with that? Uh, so I'm starting actually with all of you. Uh, Anna, before that, I, f I promised I'll, I'll uh, well, present our special guest. But uh, we have the teacher of the special, I thought presenting her as a mother of this <laughs> creature. I don't know if it's he or she, probably it. So Daria, who is the, the teacher of, of uh, IQALO, or if you wish in Serbian, Kuvalo, IQALO. Um, but you will explain it better, uh, Daria. Okay, so coming back to the bottom perspective. Uh, I do, do you read me? <laughs> okay. Um, IQALO is um, a recent contributor to policy discussions. And actually, at the end of this video that, uh, that we showed you, there was a small disclaimer saying that the sentences that you hear are kind of what people would imagine, that an AI would you know, talk back to people when you have a conversation. But uh, what IQLO actually is, it is a real neural network. So it's like a gap between the imaginary and the real in the sense that you have like a sculpture, like a physical embodiment of all these imaginations that people have about AI. And then you have like the, the network that is doing something, like the, the machine learning system or whichever system it is. In this case, it is uh, GPT-2. And uh, what it did was uh, it analyzed uh, it because it's uh, gender neutral. Uh, it analyzed the uh, transcripts from AI sessions, all the, all the actual AI sessions on the Internet Governance Forum to be able to talk at the 
Internet Governance Forum. So I talked at the main AI session where it had kind of a similar moderator to today. And, uh, yeah. and uh, I, people liked uh, IQ Wallow, they wanted to take a picture, so um, it's not only about the brains, it's also about the looks. Yeah, well, well that, that's always a good question whether the AI should have the embodiment of a human being or it should be something like the former coffee machine, now uh, AI expert. Uh, but you can take photos afterwards with Kuvalo, a <laughs> symbolic 10 euro prize, that's fine. Um, starting with, with, uh, with uh, and uh, what's important also with, the, with this project sort of, uh, it's a combination of the, well, work with the, with the neural networks and, and really the artificial intelligence behind it or machine learning if we want it to be more precise at the moment and the artistic aspects, uh, as you can see. So on the technical aspects, we had Daria, we had uh, Milos Rancic, our colleague here, um, colleagues from, from, uh, from Diplos Data and AI Lab uh, and so on. On the artistic side, we had uh, actually Professor Vlada Veljašević from the faculty of, uh, um, how do you call it? Um, fine, arts. fine Arts, right? Uh, who, who gave a little bit of a shape of, of the machine and uh, Kuvalo will contribute today also to the discussions, and it's not contributing with fake, fake things, but actually what it learned through the learning process. Uh, the first question for you, actually, well, all of you, is what is your dream about the AI? It could be a, a good dream, a bad dream. Uh, what is a sort of a dream, Katarina, don't sit. Now we need your microphone already. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I do want literally any one of you to ra just raise their hand and try to tweet. What is your best dream or worst dream, uh, nightmare or, or a nice dream? How do you see AI in future? Uh, and we offer a couple of uh, options here. So feel free to take your phones or devices and vote. It's simple. You just go to menti.com, type the code, and you'll get the question. There'll be a couple of other questions as well. So in this first one, we basically said, um, do we see AI in future as simple workers? Do we see them as scientists? Do we see them as even artists and someone who can create something? Do we see them as bosses to the humans? Or ultimately, do we see them as becoming a superior race? So you can see some, some basic uh, inputs, 11, 12 people, go on. Anyone that wants to take uh, a first, uh, first pitch on, on how do you see the future? Uh, how do you dream about the AI? Hmm? Yeah? Yubcha, if you wish. Star Trek. Star Trek. Okay. Anyone? Anyone from the audience? Kirk. Oh, yeah, that's the Kirk. Kirk. Okay. Yeah, her, her. Her movie. <laughs> but her movie. Movie. But movie. Her. Anyone else? It doesn't have to be uh, science fiction in, in the sense that it's already uh, the story was told already. It can be something that's new. Any any Terminator scenarios? Anyone worried about, well, obviously there is a little bit of, they can be become a superior race, huh? Anyone else? Okay. Anyone of you? Uh, yes. Happily. Um, in a very self-serving kind of way, I see AI as an assistant, a personal servant, a butler, a waitress. So for instance, I have a, a dream that when I come home, the AI opens the, the door to me, my little personal robot, and uh, scans me and says, ah, you need a little bit more vitamin C, a little bit less adrenaline, a little bit of de-stressing, here's your gin and tonic, here's your detox snacks on the side, here's your foot massage, and here's a suggestion of entertainment for tonight. And while you're watching it, what shall I cook you for dinner? What do you fancy? Here's the menu. That's the kind of AI future that I see. Very much an assistant, very much at my service. Servant? A slave? <laughs> or just an assistant? I'll call it assistant for the positive connotations, but ah. I really don't mind if I don't pay it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mentioned Star Trek because I, I think that if Homo sapiens is to survive in any meaningful way, um, it's, it's great for us to nurture planet Earth and have nice farms and good food, but really any potential future has to be an interstellar species. Mm. Uh, so I see that complementarity uh, between 
what is the cyber and what is the AI and what is Homo sapiens in getting us there, in getting us in uh, among the stars, uh, exploring, uh, being uh, an assistant. And, and I would be, be careful with uh, this kind of servant, uh, you know, master narrative uh, because it, it, with the speed that it is developing, uh, we don't have a chance. <laughs> if, 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 we, if we look at it that way, if we look at it as, as, as a combative stance, the only way we can really coexist is in a, is in a complementary way. Mm -hmm. uh, and one more thing that I would throw in is that I think that very often we have this, you know, it was great that you mentioned the mother of, because very often it's the father of, uh, the father of the internet, Vince Cerf, the father of this and that. And very often this fatherly uh, kind of narrative is not the best way to uh, nurture a new being into being, because this is what we're doing. We should be aware of that. We are putting a new species, a new being into, uh, into existence and the motherly love, the motherly care, is I think is a much better way of going about it. Actually, I'm, 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 I'm worried. I don't know if I should be worried about mentioning it as a being or not, but we'll see. We'll get back to that. Katarina. Uh, just following up on that, uh, Vince Cerf, that's a really good uh, keyword because he used the acronym AI to denote not artificial intelligence, but artificial idiot. And he was basically saying we're really not at any level where it rivals our intelligence. So it's actually a kind of a very uh, mechanized, a very basic intelligence. So that was quite interesting. In terms of what I see the future of AI, in particular for me, I'm kind of, I'm kind of on, the bo on board with Liliana in terms of having an assistant. But in my case, I want an uh, assistant for creativity, someone that generates ideas for me out of chaos, that shows me patterns that then inspire, for example, my own writing. So I want a creative assistant, and in that sense, it's really interesting what we have back there, because um, exactly, I would challenge that. Okay, and Good here, here is the answer to your challenge. Uh, I would uh, call AI um, Abu Lafi. Abu Lafi was a hero from one of um, Umberto Eco's writing, where Umberto Eco argues that uh, computers are uh, metaphysical devices. And uh, I think that AI will push us to the limits of rationality because this is ultimate victory of rationality in the human interaction with nature and create us a space for arts and deeper introspections, some sort of mirror that will be developed uh, to see who we are, uh, what defines us as humans, uh, what is the purpose of us being on this rock in the in the strange, uh, strange galaxy, and that would be probably Abu Lafi. Yeah, that's my vote. That's interesting. When you mention mirror, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually a black mirror. So it really depends yeah. what we are going to see in that <laughs> mirror. But but we'll get back to that. Uh, by the way, for those that might not uh, know much of the details of the history of internet, so Vint Cerf is one of those guys that was the inventors of one of the most important things, which is the TCP/IP protocol. Then how that's the guy with the beard. Uh, he's now called himself the, uh, yeah, and actually he was, he was uh, portrayed in the, in the Matrix uh, uh, movie, even though they didn't make a clear reference, but we know that. Huh? Very often misspelled Vinserf. Vinserf, yeah. Vinserf, yeah. yeah uh, we have, purposely we have the, the, the machine or the, the air or the living or the being or the new, new race here. Uh, so I do want to ask uh, Kuvalo uh, whether, whether actually, this is sort of the thing we can expect to have in future. Uh, an assistant or, or something like that, a creature, or what this creature could possibly do. Uh, Kuvalo? The present. AI provides us with a framework. We can trust it. We can now use it to build and improve public services. And we need to make it more resilient and more secure. So, that's the practicality. Not much louder. Okay, we'll try again. Kuvalo is muted. One of the things, uh, it was singing too much. Now that's an interesting thing, whether it is he or she, it's hard to say it is, it was singing. Uh, okay, anyone wants to add to this first round of dreams? Sure, just take the mic, take the mic because we have the, the screen. Thank you. Uh, so interstellar, uh, the, the assistants, the robots in interstellar were, that's basically the, the, the way I view those assistants, assistants. So like, 
Uh, if something is off, then you go like, okay, humor minus 20%, or ingenuity plus 20%, like in assistant in that way. Yeah. You must be an engineer. By the way, can you, can you uh, introduce yourself to everyone when you... Uh, oh, when me? You Oh, I'm you Miron Petrik Popovic. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> ah, okay. okay. Uh, I'm still in high school, so uh, nothing yet. Thanks. No, basically, whoever takes the mic, just please introduce yourself so that we know the, the people in the room. Okay, anyone else? Uh, if not, let, let's move to the, basically, first bigger chunk of things. What are we talking about? And I want to start with, uh, and we're not going to open the discussion what AI is and how do we define it and so on, but I do want to hear from you, all of you, what do you think that intelligence is? Because I think that's the first thing that we, that we're talking about. So artificially, it's okay. It can be, as they said, uh, coming from the art and so on. But what is intelligence? Um, Bilan, you want to try? And for all of you, by the way, while Bilan is taking the mic, uh, any of the words that, that define or associate intelligence, just throw them. So we'll, we'll make a word cloud of of the, the thoughts of the, but try to use a word or maximum two, two words and just add more if you wish. So you can start posting. Yeah. Okay, well for me, intelligence <coughs> is compositional. So there's rational intelligence, which is analytical and uh, depends on logic and reasoning and building arguments. But then there's also a creative intelligence, which is much more associative and intuitive and looks at similarities and dissimilars, for instance, as we find in metaphor. Uh, and then there's also a social and emotional intelligence, which is very much looking at context and dynamics between people, above all people. And for me, intelligence, we are all capable of all three of these components, but what drives us in our intelligence, what articulates our intelligence is language, Without language, we can't communicate our ideas, and actually we can't even articulate them to ourselves, because we always find it difficult to translate that woolly thinking that we have in our heads into a stream of coherent words and sentences that build up into arguments or narratives. So I think language is absolutely instrumental to what I understand human intelligence to be about. And articulating our intelligence has another dimension, because we can refine and sophisticate our thoughts as a result of language. So we bounce our ideas off each other, we bounce them off our internal dialogue, but our <coughs> intelligence really comes into its own as a result of language. And a good example of that is evidence from deaf and dumb people, for instance, somebody like Helen Keller, who came to language late in life and others whose biographies also speak about what happened to them when they came to language, when they discovered language. In all cases, they felt that they had entered into a world of possibilities, a world of light, where suddenly there was just that much more that their minds could engage with than there <coughs> had been when they were pre-linguistic. So that's, for me, intelligence, I very wonder, much coupled with language. I wonder if, if the two machines which develop their own language fits into that. And we've seen that already, where we had to switch them off because we started not understanding their language anymore. Yes, and I think that it's, it's, it's a really key question. Which parts of our intelligence are, is AI capable mm -hmm. of? And how does it relate mm. to our language, or how does it develop its own? I think those, those questions are key to the artificial We'll elements. get back to that. Um, intelligence, Lipcha. Well, um, taking the, the cue from, from what Biljana just now said, uh, and as well from any of these things, the, the, the thing is that all of these things basically can be put into an algorithm, uh, one. And two, uh, if you have, let's say, two algorithms communicating between, them, between each other, they may use language that is completely different to the language that we understand and uh, the speed, more importantly, that we use. Uh, and in that sense, that language, I mean, this is what happened basically with Google Translate, right? Like in 2017, 2016, uh, uh, basically it created its own language in order to be able to communicate all the other languages, again, with the addition of machine learning uh, and that kind of uh, analysis. But the point is that, and to bring in, again, the Vince Cerf's artificial idiot, the artificial idiot is because we're still at a very nascent stage. Be basically, the machine learning revolution started around 2008, really. 
so we, we're a decade into uh, this kind of development. And I'm, I'm assuming that many of you, of you have heard of, uh, you know, the latest uh, chess game between what was the computer program to finish all computer programs, you know, from the time that Kasparov won, uh, lost in 1997 to Deep Blue to a few years ago, a program, an artificial intelligence, was based on all the human knowledge about chess. And it was put to play against an algorithm that learned to play chess by playing against itself. And uh, within a few hours, within less than a day of playing hundreds of thousands of games against itself, it was able to beat this, again, program 94 out of 100 games and drew six re remis. So it's an idiot because it's very <laughs> narrow in its knowledge. But we have a lot of now narrow things like that. And at one point, they may connect. So this is the whole artificial general intelligence, what is usually dis make distinct from it. So the language that we're using is actually you know, like watching a snail <coughs> in comparison to uh, a starship, uh, in terms of the, the speed of that development. If we learn from each other, from each other's emotions, from each other's uh, insights, uh, rational, logical, whatever they may be, imagine that multiplied by a factor of, you know, gazillion, or whatever number you wanna, wanna choose in, in, in seconds. So that kind of speed and uh, uh, depth of knowledge uh, can, very com com can come very quickly, and that is the revolutionary thing about it. I promised I won't uh, allow too much going into the philosophical discussion on, on intelligence, uh, but it's interesting here we have creativity and empathy. Well, folks, creativity just uh, it goes against what you wanted in the first slide where we said that it can't be the artist. So I, I wonder whether creativity is something that we can expect. Uh, but Katarina. Yeah, thanks, Sara. I'm actually going to defy you because I'm going to talk about the definition of AI. <laughs> Um, so we, it's kind of difficult to define intelligence, but the way we always do it is in relation to us, to ourselves. And we kind of do the same thing with artificial intelligence, which is a little bit of the problem. So one of the standard definitions of artificial intelligence is computer systems able to perform tasks normally associated with human intelligence. So image recognition, language uh, recognition, speaking a language, decision making, etc., etc. So our concept of intelligence is very often rooted in how we are in the world and how we understand the world. And it's a, that needs to be challenged a little bit, that we're kind of anthropomorphizing AI to a certain extent. So as this development in artificial intelligence continues, I think that's something we perhaps need to challenge, that we need a perspective that is fundamentally perhaps non-human, non-rooted in our s knowledge, our system, our way of thinking, our way of being in the world. But then how can we even imagine that? So Coffee machine. It's yeah, absolutely not maybe he, uh, she, it can, can tell us later. Yeah. yeah, that's, I think that's important. Before you one, anyone want, wants to jump in? Don't be shy. Now, since uh, Kat, you uh, gave us definition, it's, uh, you gave me a space to, uh, to speak about philosophy a bit. Uh, but uh, one, one element which is interesting from the, the Vox Populi or, the, or the, uh, your inputs is that there are very few inputs on rationality, logic, cog traditional cognition. You have something human reasoning, you have, okay, knowledge, accurate, skills, but we have creativity and empathy in the center. And as Vlada said, it defines the first pool where the artists were uh, ranking relatively low. But it explains uh, our intuitive, I would say, reaction that we are essentially losing the battle on the rational level. And this is a crucial discussion that we are going to face as uh, humanity because two pillars of the enlightenment and rationality are uh, free will, centrality of humans uh, in, uh, in society, this is what last three or four centuries the world was battling for, and optimization and rationality. On one side you have democracy, freedom, human rights, on the other side you have industrialization, modernity, and science. And it is clear that uh, the science, modernity, and rationality are winning this battle. Therefore we are moving from the relatively lost ground where we cannot win against artificial intelligence 
towards creativity, empathy, context, engagement. What I try to summarize as Abu Lafi's business. <coughs> Bit of sometimes metaphysics uh, and something which cannot be basically summarized with traditional cognition. Therefore, your, your basically vote here is a vote for, it's written, we are losing the battle on a rationality level, but there is still some space for us in the field of creativity and empathy. Um, I w yes, I, 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 I may even challenge that, because I think that the, the past three, four hundred years have certainly, from a Eurocentric point of view, but the world is quite Eurocentric, unfortunately, <laughs> or fortunately, or whatever, uh, uh, over the past century, certainly, um, is defined much more by power, by <coughs> capitalism, by uh, the sovereign system of states, and a battle between them in which this rationality has played an instrumental role, but it's been an instrument. Science has been an instrument of militaries. Uh, has been or is still? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it, they've always gone together. The, the, the greatest scientific leaps have always been in some way combined with military uh, aspects, security aspects. Including and it's, Including yeah, absolutely. It DARPA is a defense. The, the first, the, the D is defense. So, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, this is an essential aspect to bear in mind because it, it brings into uh, focus a central element of analysis, unit of analysis, and that is power. And when, when viewed from that point of view, then all of this starts taking a different um, focus. Because if we look at the two main operating systems in which we function right now, uh, and one may be actually said to be the operating <coughs> systems, another one is the perhaps at the, at, the, at, the, at the level based on that. And capitalism is this operating system in which we function. Uh, the capitalist is even go, going beyond the system of states. But this other thing is the system of states. And I think it is very important to look at how AI may impact both of those dynamics. Mm. How it may impact the economic relationships, which are in any given state and also between states, and how it will impact the security uh, considerations between uh, states and within states as well. Because we're not only talking about weapons that may be used against other states. We're, we're, we can see that right now in many states, we're in many countries where AI is combined with weapons to keep internal populations uh, peaceful or obedient or controlled. Or controlled. You wish. So this is a, a, a when 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 you look at it through that prism, uh, it becomes less philosophical and it becomes quite, quite tangent. I'll, I'll keep the word, particularly the one that you mentioned, uh, which is power which I think reflects uh, the, the, te the, the tendency of the humans and will probably be reflected also in the AI. I'll keep it for the, for the next part of the discussion when we talk about the, the humanity and hum human values or, or tendencies in AI. But before that, while we are exploring what AI is, I wanted to hear from you, well, from all of you again, uh, where are we now? So what can we say that AI can do and cannot do now? Maybe some examples even. I uh, remember I think you shared one of the interesting um, interviews uh, by, by a UK professor who said uh, that distinguishing the AI or, or the AI uh, that we might be looking for should be able to distinguish, for instance, between the correlations and causality. And we are far from that. Now, I challenge that because I think probably 90% of human population will fail on that one. So there is a lot of these things that we are talking about that probably a lot of human population would fail if we put as an intelligence level. But where are we now? And Katerina, I know that you have some of the good examples. Uh, where are we now with some of the applications of IE or AI? And, uh, and what are the, the potentials? And I also encourage all of you to share uh, any of your thoughts or examples what, what we are seeing currently AI doing, doing well. Cut. Okay, let me start with uh, two problems to outline. When we talk about AI, we already have a huge uh, challenge, which is what are we actually talking about? Because AI is, uh, in a sense, it's a moving target. So when we say artificial intelligence, we're always meaning, we're always describing the kind of thing that is just being developed, just on the horizon. So things that we refer to as AI 20, 30 years ago, we no longer call AI. So with AI, we're always on this horizon to the future uh, kind of line. 
And the other thing is when we talk about AI in, in this broad term, we really have a challenge because AI is actually a, such an umbrella term for many, many different things, not just many applications, but kind of many systems behind, uh, behind the application. So in terms of applications, uh, what we see are huge advances in machine learning. So basically that means huge amounts of data are put into a system and the system makes sense of that data by recognizing patterns or by uh, finding similarities. And all the advances we see in AI are based on machine learning. And the best example we have or the m example of the most applications and with the most advances and with the most benefits to humanity at the moment, as I see it, is image recognition. So image recognition in the sense that um, having scans of your body and AI being able to identify is there cancer, is there a problem. And it's a huge leap ahead in, in medical terms and there hu there's huge progress being made. Going back to kind of our world at Diplo of international relations, we also have the application of image recognition in, for example, looking at refugee camps and how they develop, looking at uh, environmental problems in deforestation and analyzing these satellite images automatically to help people who work on these environmental issues, to help people who work in the humanitarian sector to even understand how cities are developing, how refugee camps are changing. And then the second bit that I find really interesting in terms of developments are developments in language processing. And that's for us as people working with diplomats, that's a key thing. And what I find really interesting is the kind of automatically uh, automated analysis of huge amounts of contracts that a human would take a long time to actually go through. And then getting results to negotiators to actually help them to prepare much quicker. There's a good example in the area of trade negotiations where there is a system developed, uh, the Cognitive Trade Advisor, which helps trade negotiators prepare much faster for the negotiations they're actually going into. And there, the other interesting thing that we're just on, on the cusp of seeing examples and interesting examples is automatically generating text from previous inputs of text. And there is like a what Kuval is doing. Exactly. Yeah. So the example is uh, from an organization called OpenAI, and the system is called GPT-2. <laughs> And that's basically what's behind here and what we're also experimenting with. So that's really interesting and that's really pushing our understanding of ourselves in terms of intelligence, in terms of writing text, in terms of creativity. But I, I wonder, all of those examples actually fit to something what some of the scientists said. It's basically curve fitting. It's basically having the AI to do some <laughs> basic things like, okay, recognizing images, putting in some boxes and so on, categorizing but not think out of the context, not being able to explain the world to us, mm. which might be the next step. So we are probably not yet there. Huh? Exactly, it's the next step, but mm. we're, not, we're not there yet. So we're dealing a lot with correlation. And the other challenging thing, especially when we look towards AI to help us make decisions, is it's really collecting data about the past. So it's giving mm. us a kind mm -hmm. of summary of the past, or it's giving us patterns from the past, which then the challenges does that mean we're kind of locked into repeating the past, if <coughs> that's what we're kind mm -hmm. of basing our decisions on? So yeah, I think that's exactly what you yeah, described. That's, are, yeah, yeah. that's the limit where we are. Any inputs from your side? Uh, yeah, Milos. Uh, <coughs> Introduce yourself. For ah, me. I'm Milos Andrich and I'm working on that GPT-2. Uh, uh, I, I just wanted to add one thing uh, to make to, to the audience clear on, on the basis of what uh, Catherine said. Uh, AI as a technology uh, is not anything we do not know uh, the principles of how it works. Uh, we do not know, in, in s uh, there is one particular issue related to the neural networks per se, but in, the in relation to the principles, we know that. And it is very comparable with any other kind of uh, our knowledge. So it's not something which is, uh, how to say, uh, mystical or we do not understand. Uh, and uh, how to say, it's a tool. It's, it, it's, a, it's a kind of computational logical tool which we are using in the same way we are using other programs, other, you know. Uh, from my perspective, when I am making that uh, output, uh, I'm using GPT-2 as uh, uh, just another function uh, uh, 
of the program of the of the program it could be the function could be uh, show me the words on the monitor or uh, the function could be uh, calculate depth uh, in this case the function is uh, uh, recognize the patterns and uh, randomly give the output mm -hmm. based on the based patterns, on the yeah. patterns yeah. okay uh, we have in front of us in, in, in that is that we may recognize the principles, we may be able to kind of and perhaps even explain it later and it's good that you highlighted the neural uh, uh, kind of learning aspect, the, the, the neural networks that uh, has been basically be behind much of the success of AI over the past 10-ish years or so, together with machine learning, together with higher computing power, together with more data to, to do it with. But there's a great article, uh, and I, I can send it, and it, if, if there is a kind of a list, it would be uh, great to forward, of uh, a lot of people working on AI uh, have put together anecdotes uh, of their experiences where they've been surprised uh, by what comes out. And the surprise is, again, w once you get it, you can explain it. But the surprise is interesting in that how AI goes about solving a given problem, because we may give it uh, a virtual uh, space and we may say these are the parameters. You have limbs, you, have, you can go like this and the expectation is that they may evolve legs or arms and then walk or jump. But actually what, for, for instance, AI can do is grow into one big, so the idea is get from here to here and instead of walking or developing limbs, it goes like this as high as possible and just falls down. So we are surprised by the way it solves problems in that. Creativity it's a, in a way. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, so it's, it's this, this aspect of evolution. Mm. And b we've been accustomed to having evolution uh, described in terms of the geographical space that we occupy. Because we know that, you know, we can say, well, this evolved like this and that because of the geographical uh, nature, the, 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 the soil, the winds, the sun, the, 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 et cetera, et cetera, humidity. But once we get out of that, all of a sudden we get surprised by how it does that, this aspect of digital evolution. Uh, may, may I just, just one thing? Uh, I, I, I will just give one my anecdote. Uh, and it is a kind of, um, I, I call them, uh, I, I call that uh, uh, a dirty little secret of uh, people who are working on AI. Um, uh, on, I mean, AI, I mean, on neural networks yeah. and generating text. That. Uh, uh, the, 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 proce the process of generating the text is something like I'm, I, I get the, um, uh, a lot of text and then I'm uh, telling to the, uh, uh, to the program to uh, analyze it and then to generate it, uh, to generate the text. But uh, besides that, I'm getting that program with uh, predefined, I mean, with pre-trained models. So I can say to uh, the program, just generate. And I, I don't need any other text to, uh, to use to, uh, to generate it. And uh, that's based on OpenAI's database, which is quite large. And uh, I generated, let's say, three texts for the beginning. Okay, let's see what, I mean, how that program works. And the first text was about terrorism. The second text was a very elaborated uh, apology of rape, of rapist. The third text was also something like that. Uh, uh, what, what, what does it mean? Uh, it just repeats what we have given to, to it. Mm. Okay. Uh, What's the dirty secret? What? What's the dirty secret? Oh, he can't tell everything. Then. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. The, 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 that little secret, you know, you know when, when you, that's the, it's not about AI. It's about humanity. That's it. Yeah, but it's about us. It's about and what, it, we, what it and how we feed into the machine. Yes, to learn, right? yes. Okay. Uh, Let me just give you one anecdote from this morning. It is 5.30 at Geneva Airport. 
I'm uh, everybody is going for holidays. I uh, uh, traveled this morning and I'm queuing uh, in front of EasyJet um, uh, counter to leave my luggage. And somebody is waving to me. He's here in the audience. Igor, where are you? Hi, Igor is there. Igor is waving and uh, I say, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm waiting for the to leave my uh, bags. And he said, are you crazy? You are late. And then uh, he put me literally out of the queue and we went to the special counter and I left my, my bag. Now, uh, my question was then, we had one hour and a half flight, I was thinking, uh, what went in Igor's mind? That there are some lost souls from Belgrade queuing and he was walking around to see if he can spot them. He spotted me <laughs> and he basically brought me and helped me to come to the plane. Can AI do it? It's a mix of uh, patterns, statistical patterns, that some people will be in the wrong queue or they are uh, late at the airport and you can develop complete mathematical model around that. But it, it brings me uh, back in the time, in the 80s, uh, those of you are of a younger generation, at that time in mid 80s, I lived in Kumodraj, which is a small uh, suburb uh, city uh, or, uh, or uh, compound, and there were three uh, parts of Kumo, there was a village, sort of middle class part and military police part. And in mid 80s when it was forbidden to sing the nationalist songs, I realized that people from the uh, military police part at the parties, they were always singing nationalist songs. And I said, what's going wrong? They were sons and daughters of uh, generals, of policemen and uh, and, uh, and the op quite opposite in the village. And then I said, okay, I have to do a bit of science. And I went to the uh, managers of the three supermarkets and asked them before Eastern to uh, give me statistics about consumption of purchase of fish in those three supermarkets. And it was clear that in the military police, there was the highest consumption of the fish, purchase of fish, than in middle class and the uh, village part. Now, this is in a way AI. You cannot see the wind. You cannot, you can feel the wind or you can see the trees that are moving. This is the wind in our perception. That sale of the fish was the indicator to give me, which I was feeling intuitively by going to the parties and uh, speaking to people that something is changing in social fabric. And this is basically the key <coughs> function of AI to detect like X-ray, real X-ray of a medical X-ray or linguistical X-ray to detect the patterns that we may not see with the extremely huge load of information. And this is one of the key function I would say of AI then through simple computation from the, from the, from the mathematics. And that's the also place where we are going to be hacked as Harari is saying through understanding the patterns that we are not aware of. That's the key game in the AI. And, and, and I, Milana, and before I that. ask you, when you say that they're going to understand the patterns that we're not aware of, is AI going to understand the significance mm. of those patterns or are we needed in order to read that significance? We are needed. Because I think we are. Relevance and significance is precisely why we're so central in that loop and on a couple of mentions, now, I've had the impression that you're nearly apologetic that we're at the center of this story. But why yeah. shouldn't we be? Because after all, our intelligence is about processing the world in a way that makes it relevant to us, whatever our relevance happens to be, whether it's the big one of survival of the, or the small one of, uh, you know, the, whatever it happens to be, right? So relevance and significance is something that we bring to it. Now, the big question for me is, <laughs> Is AI going to be able to introduce its own sense of relevance to us? Or will it bring a completely different kind of relevance that is relevant to it? That's, that's something that I'm and interested that's the key in. And that's a question to in what direction this, this whole development is driving and uh, whether we are going to remain in the center of AI or whether actually AI may sort of surpass us. But, but be, uh, we are not going to have the moment uh, the turning point. Uh, it is like what Hemingway said when they asked him how he got bankrupt. He said in two ways. First gradually and then suddenly. Mm. 
-hmm. And this is the way we are already in searching for information. Water? Mm -hmm. It's okay? Di what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, in searching for information, in, uh, in uh, finding the ideal pat uh, partners that we may get, in finding ideal car, uh, 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 ideal tour, we are already seeding elements of uh, our choice and free will to machines. We are not forced to that. Machines are giving us better options, better choices. I'm afraid that this Hemingway style process of sliding gradually to the point where it will be too late to, to regain the control is most likely the major risk in interplay between humans and AI. And there is but another- You're attributing an anthropomorphic intelligence to AI and giving no. it the desire to control us and we're back to that master-servant no, no, dynamic, not, not which controlling I don't us. Think uh, is necessarily appropriate. IQ Valo is not controlling us. Yes. He's giving us advice what to do. It's but his, ad role. his advice is so powerful that it is de facto reducing our free will and the right to free choice. Ah, but every good speaker is so persuasive that Agreed. he is also reducing our free will because we jump on the bad wagon of the person who can articulate ideas better than us Definitely. or can analyze data better than us. Yeah. So we do it amongst each other as humans and now we're introducing an additional factor within our human circle. But I think that that human circle, that network of individuals that comes together to make a collective is absolutely essential to the story and we shouldn't forget that. It's a human social context that these machines are being invited into. And actually, as far as I understand, they don't yet, un they don't yet, are they're not yet able to attribute significance or extract significance, what's significant to us. And, and that's why they're such poor read, and it's because they're such poor readers of context. And the, 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 the key word is yet. So one, one thing that, uh, and I'm passing to, to Lucha, one thing that two of us also discussed some time ago is that one of the, the biggest flaws in education of humans is not understanding the exponential function. You remember that? That we just don't understand how exponential function suddenly ex explodes and we lose the control. Now we can get back to that whether we are losing the control over or not. Lucha, can we take yeah. one, one uh, over there if anyone else I, has? Is Katarina uh, okay? Uh, can anyone check if Katarina is okay? But there may be a paradigm um, shift Katarina, you can rather the, than an exponential curve. And if anyone else wants to jump in. Yeah, so you were talking about the point of no return and, and we were mentioning this, uh, this a few times. Um, could you define, please, what is actually the worst case scenario? What is beyond uh, that line? Like, what is that bad point, exactly? Yeah. The, the, uh, for whom, for, for whom was that? For, for anyone. So the point of no return, is, is there such a, such a sort of a triggering point when we can't get back? Let me get to that second, but just I wanted to kind of jump into, the, into this and, um, you know, this is uh, to jump out of the um, aspect of communication between uh, AI and, and humans, uh, but rather it, to come back to this kind of mirror image of that it gives us. Um, and what Jovan said earlier about the fact that, you know, it's making us face up our philosophies, our realities in a, as, as a species. So if some of us as individuals may have been more introspect and kind of gone deep into ourselves, um, and even as Carl Jung would say, kind of looked into every aspect, including the darker side of us, now we see that you know what it is coming out is that we are actually a violent species, and we know that we see that now. Finally, perhaps you know in terms of because the, the planet is becoming smaller and smaller for us, but it is coming. It's it's taking these things and it's putting us, it, it, it put it in front of us, and and we have to start dealing with that as a species to be, to, to be able to see what it shows us and to be able to say okay. What do we do about this? So it's actually, so there, this is one it's actually looking at the mirror and, and dealing with our problems. Yeah, right? and, and, and we can deal with it in a few ways, like individuals. Some of us may wish to kind of, uh, uh, some of us will say, okay, let me see it, the tantric way. Let me put it in front of me and see what, 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 what comes out uh, in that. But uh, the, the key thing is one, like how, how open are we to take that input and then say, okay, we take this to become better ourselves and to create a better environment. 
But then we are also a very scared species. And we've been, for the past 70,000 years uh, of, of development, we've, we've been scared throughout, unfortunately. We've been Luckily at the bottom. 40 million years. Sorry? Luckily 40, 50 million years. So, I mean, but, but uh, especially this. But to, to answer perhaps the, the, the point of no return, m the, you know, to come back to what basically what I, I was doing this year in terms of chairing the, this, this, the UN body on, on the combination of artificial intelligence and, 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 and weapons. And the, one of the key problems is that we're not dealing with a weapon. We're not dealing with a landmine, with a missile. With, we're dealing with any existing weapon and any potential weapon and combining with, with, uh, with AI. And there, the issue is, and this is why I bring in this Westphalian system, we, 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 the system itself, and especially in geographically concentrated areas like Europe, is based on this fear of the other. What's the other going to do? Well, if the other is doing this, then I better do this quicker, and I better give autonomy more to this subsystem of systems, and then this subsystem, and then to the system as a whole, and then to the system of systems. So this is where this fear is going to make us give autonomy more and more to more and more autonomous functions that are not ready to take it, you know? Uh, and, and then we, and the, the danger scenario is of course, and there are people who are really thinking about this, is to put that kind of autonomy to what is called the strategic stability of nuclear weapons. Even if it is for defensive purposes, it, the, p the past 70 years have been the exception to, to the human species, the violent human species, because of nuclear weapons, because of the fear of mutually assured destruction. So if you affect the defensive aspect of it, you affect the whole equilibrium of it. Because uh, then... Uh, can you explain a little bit more what does it mean, the autonomy of such weapons, practically speaking? It can be different for any weapon. So I mean, it's... It, it, the Just an example so that we get an idea of practically what it means when, when you embed okay. an AI into a weapon of so that kind. So let me use some of the most advanced currently at the moment. Uh, and these are no top secret, these are known that, uh, that are there, right? So there is the Israeli Harpy, which has been developed in many other countries. Uh, it's basically a drone that roams around in a given area. It's given uh, parameters of, let's say, 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. And it's given the license if it detects uh, a signature of a radar in a given area to attack immediately. So it autonomously decides to attack and destroy, right? There's no, it doesn't seek human input to do that. So the distinction is very often made between automation and uh, semi-autonomy, full autonomy, etc. so that, that it is a spectrum between the two. But this is what we're talking about, automation that a landmine or something like that, you know, you step on it and automatically decides, that it just does this as a, as, a, as a response to it. And then some degrees of autonomy where it analyzes based on sensors and then it decides what to do. So this kind of logic can be put into anything. And the more advanced uh, situations that are happening right now are based around swarms. So uh, again, to illustrate, uh, you know, we have already drones that are autonomous and in their functionings, like I said, like the, 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 the harpy. But the current research is based on swarms that are going against each other. So you have a swarm of 20 drones against a swarm of other 20 drones. And basically, they're given the algorithm, learn, adapt, and you know, kill the others. So they fly, 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 and then fly, fly, fly the others, and they learn from each other and they adapt. No one's controlling them. The whole swarm of 20 against 20 are flying autonomously and finding <coughs> the best ways to beat the others. So they're learning and, and learning, and at one point, the idea is to... So this can be put into air, underwater, on land, uh, and, and this is where it gets tricky, because the uh, application is going to be different underwater, it's going to be different on water, on the surface of water, in land, uh, in cyberspace, in, in outer space, uh, the, but, but, the, but the, the, the movement is in that direction. To give autonomy more and more to different systems or systems of systems or subsystems so In, in to your case, in case of dealing with, uh, with, with weapons, one of the worst things that can happen is actually taking lives, right? And taking lives without uh, control over human. And this is probably this division of human um, in the loop, human deciding on everything, human on the loop where human can simply pull the brake, or human off the loop where a human doesn't have any control of what the AI is doing, is probably the most dangerous in, in case of lives. I remember the report that the UN high level panel issued on digital cooperation. There was one of the recommendations which clearly said one thing we can't allow AI to do is to decide on matters on, on life and death. 
I don't know if you want to comment how do you come up on to that sort of a limitation value in the discussion in the high level panel. Well, I, we, we came to that uh, formulation through discussion on ethics uh, and the core values of the ethics and the question of life and that is one of the, in, I would say, all the religions and it's sort of unifying uh, uh, element uh, cross culture, cross religious is a question of respect for life and respect for dignity. There are differences in other, other spaces, but that, that's the key element. And then uh, that decision was made, although it has some controversial aspects. The ultimate point is that machine should not, uh, or autonomous system, should not uh, make decision to, to kill a human. Uh, and that's, that's sort of uh, ultimately, the human ultimately should uh, press the mm. button or do. Does it make any difference? It's also, also a question that we can, uh, can discuss. The person on the other side is, is killed. But that could be some sort of border zone and line that, that could, uh, could uh, keep that uh, space for us, what Biljana mentioned, us as ultimately decision makers about the key uh, uh, aspects of the, of the of humanity, like question of life and death. Now the interesting thing is, you mentioned okay, we mentioned the issues of life and death and, and all of that, but to what extent the AI actually would embrace these values or the limitations that we have? And Milos spoke about that we are the ones who are training the AI, but you just mentioned that at some point the AI start learning from each other, and it can lose the track of of what we what we fed it with, right? Uh, so firstly, what are the values that we want to embed into AI, and I guess there are no universal values, I guess, well, I mean. We, we counted, for example, on fairness. There was mm. interesting discussion about fairness, and there are 17, one seven, different uh, understanding of fairness. What is fair? When you make decision, decision should be fair. There were 17 different uh, definitions of fairness. Now, uh, we can say, okay, we are in charge, like this question of the life and death, but ultimately, AI-driven systems are starting to take decisions in juridical processes, autonomous uh, cars. We have the trolley uh, famous case, whom to save the old lady or young, uh, young uh, yappies or whatever dilemmas are. Therefore, the system will have to make decisions. And the key, the key question now, how to embed software applications, algorithms with the certain values? And you can, you can imagine this is the kind of worms, you know, what values. For example, in that, that question, whom to save, uh, there was uh, MIT did some sort of um, study. Uh, people from China, they prefer to save uh, older people, which is good news for me. Uh, <laughs> Europeans prefer to, uh, to save uh, uh, young children and mother with young children. And Europeans. Uh, Europeans. Uh, and European babies. And European, and European and babies. And babies. Well. <laughs> Uh, that's, but, but now if you are creating, let's say, a car, if, if, uh, if Tesla has to create a car, okay, it can adjust to the different uh, uh, spaces, but there are, there are uh, we are embedding values and uh, into decisions this, this AI system have to make. And this is that what, what Hemingway said, that we are gradually ceding our choices, our responsibilities to machines through functional ways. It's nice to have autonomous cars, yeah, well, you don't need, you can, uh, you don't need to take care of what you are drinking in the evening before you, uh, you're driven back home. There are many advantages which we will be basically taking uh, step by step and ceding our autonomy and our uh, right to choose. And in that process, we'll be also ceding the question of selecting values and priorities because system has to decide. But firstly, how do we select if we don't agree globally what the values are and we don't agree on, on fairness or ethics or whatever, what ethics means? I mean, means probably different to, uh, I don't know, the Asians and the, and the Americans. And then secondly, is it, is it possible still to embed it with all the, as you said, the southern changes? Huh? Uh, look, sure, then. This is why I mentioned earlier about <laughs> the, the, you know, the operating system is capitalism. It will be based, based on capitalism. You know, unfortunately or fortunately, we should be aware of that. That this is, when, when that is the system, um, the incentives are going to be ruled by the incentives uh, uh, of the operating system. And unfortunately, uh, you know, what we're going to, what we're seeing already is the beginning of walled gardens, either physical or, or digital, that are starting to arise. Uh, and, and the division 
uh, between people. And, and it's going to reflect gradually until it reflects in a given, in a physical wall, really, between one type of homo sapiens and other types of homo sapiens. And, and that's, that's and, and unfortunately, uh, that's going to be shaped mostly not by our values or not by our philosophy, not by our morals, but really about from, from what the operating system says. And the operating system says, save the capitalists. <laughs> I, I have an interesting, before passing to, to Katerina, on, on uh, uh, can we actually embed the, the values and, um, and the ethics in the AI? I have a poll for you where you can, uh, you can uh, follow up on that, which is uh, who's actually in charge? Who's the most responsible for bringing in the values to the system? So should it be the tech sector, those, uh, the geeks? Should it be the companies, the private sector, which is driving the commercialization? Should it be the governments, the users, the religious organizations, any other? Uh, so you can, you can cast your vote. Uh, and of course, raise the hand if you wish to jump in at any point. Uh, Katerina. is, for example, if we're asking AI to help us kind of define these, um, and that's something we're going to come back to, I think, but if you ask AI to help us in defining these ethical codes, these values, there are two different ways of doing that, right? One way is, again, machine learning, where it's kind of surveying all of human knowledge or all of the ethical principles we have, and then maybe we find some kind of middle ground. And, and the other way to kind of make AI more ethical is another route which is called symbolic AI. And so symbolic AI is kind of the opposite to the kind of machine learning AI that we've been talking about a lot, where we actually decide on certain principles and kind of hard code them into the software, into the system. But then again, as everyone on this panel has been saying, what are these values and how do we, how do we decide uh, on these values? And what I'd like to bring in, in into this discussion is maybe we need to start from a very, very lowest uh, common denominator. Uh, and here I'd like to remind uh, everyone of a science fiction example, which is Isaac's, uh, Isaac Asimov's laws of robotics. So kind of starting from very basic principles. And for example, his first law of robotics is uh, a robot is not allowed to harm a human being. And then all the other principle, principles kind of build on that. So the second principle, a robot is supposed to obey the commands of a human being unless the second command or the second principle violates the first, et cetera, et cetera. So perhaps that's something we should agree on, and that's actually an interesting contribution to the lethal autonomous weapons uh, discussion. Because how do you find ethics in killing people? Maybe we should start from, or I like to bring forth, maybe we should start from the idea that let's not go there. <laughs> any, any comments in the meantime? Yeah, uh, let's, let's take another one. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Um, so you said, we, when we were talking about um, that we don't want to give um, robots the option to choose who to kill, like, do we actually really want to give humans that choice? Like, we were, we were, I, I, okay, I wasn't because I'm too young for that, but 20, uh, 25 years ago, we were the, the people here that lived are, were the witnesses of grotesque and, and disgusting and abomination and abominous uh, wrongdoings. And the humans were in, in were in charge of that. And so I'm not quite sure if I want to give humans the freedom to choose who to kill. So and, and this is a, a, an excellent way of, you know, the, the basis of a state should be to, and, and uh, uh, one aspect is to, co to come back to this uh, focus on power, is to have the monopoly on power, right? Like monopoly of the use of force. Uh, because of this, because humans within any given community have not proven to be quite peaceful always uh, against each other, uh, both at the individual level and certainly at the group level. Uh, and uh, the we have shown that uh, this fear, has, especially if there's a, f a group that we feel somehow is coming for our resources or we don't have any resources and we're gonna go from them. So there's always, well, what, what are they doing? And, and what, are, what are we, and that's the reason why we, can, we, we cannot go into a philosophy of war. I mean, conflict happens. Uh, it's, it's a part of, unfortunately, uh, our, our way of being. Uh, and even if it wasn't, 
perhaps we would need to invent it because even if we were the most peaceful species and somehow we uh, existed on this planet, there may be another planet with more harsher uh, environments that uh, whose beings come and we would not have an opportunity to defend ourselves. Conflict is a way, is, is, is a presence in the, in the, in the universe. Two uh, uh, electrons are fighting for the same space in the, in, in the sun and this is where the energy comes for, the, for uh, this planet to exist. This kind of tension is, is a part of everything and killing, unfortunately, uh, is a part of that. Uh, and to start with should we or shouldn't we is again putting us this mirror in front of us mm. of, of is the moralizing based on anything other than a wish for th things not to be like that. Uh, and, and we really have to start with things as they are uh, and, and, and build on that. So uh, probably killing is the, the radical example, uh, the most striking one. But there are many others now that we are seeing with facial recognition algorithms, all that. When we feed into certain sample of, let's say, white people or older people, or you know, and then the bias is created already on that level. So you can have um, uh, some sort of discrimination by the AI and, and many other things which are not really killing. Huh? So there is a bunch of other values which are which are somewhere there, and the good question is whether, and I think your point is right, whether, whether the humans, as you said, the mirror, whether humans already do it in the right, in the right way, we discriminate a lot. Could the AI maybe reduce that discrimination, or is it going to amplify it? That's, Piana. I, I think that's a very valid question. I think AI, again, if it's going to be assisting us in the goals that we're setting ourselves, and if our goal is to be more humane towards each other, is in a position to assist us and not necessarily to go off into these terrible scenarios that uh, some of which you have painted for us. I think human beings are at their most interesting when they are dealing with conflicts of values, whether because there's a conflict in defining a single value such as fairness or honor or compassion, whatever it happens to be, because we have very many def uh, different definitions of each of them, right? Or whether the conflict is within a given individual or within a given community between values that are competing with each other. And actually what's terribly human about us is that we fudge and we nudge and we, we, we kind of adjust to circumstances and then justify our behaviors accordingly. And that's where bias comes in because the community can come and consolidate your individual actions. If, you're, you know, if you have a position of leadership, you can influence them and then all together you can move in a particular direction. And that can be either hugely harmful or hugely beneficial. But it's this way we have of negotiating that space where values come in conflict with each other that really defines us as human beings. And Kat uh, brought up uh, you know, uh, 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 literature, and there's a very, very good book that came out a couple of years ago called Machines Like Us by Julian Barnes, where interestingly enough, there's a kind of reverse scenario to the one that we've been talking about with this critical point, this tipping point. And that is that these um, machines were developed as personal companions and they could do whatever you wanted them to do and do it much better than you and so they facilitated your life hugely. But ultimately, they found it incredibly difficult to come to terms with human compromise and contradictions and the fact that we were so inconsistent in our ethics. So we would favoritize, we would contradict, we would compromise, and they, in their clean, rule-governed uh, way, found that kind of fudging just corrupt. And what happened was that they started to self-destroy because they could not <laughs> endure human messiness. That's an interesting uh, develop, a possible development. It was another one that we had, when was it, a couple of years ago, we had this uh, celebration in Malta, 15 years of Diplo. We had a discussion on the role of the AI in diplomacy. And then one of the questions with the old ambassadors was, could the AI actually replace the ambassadors and diplomats? And they were, of course, no, 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 there's no, no way. But then there was a good argument, like in negotiating, we have all these human aspects that we have. And the machines, if you put them together, might, might not have that. For instance, in, in the game theory, you know the, the case of the prisoner, prisoner's dilemma, where you have two prisoners which are forced in different cells 
if they both admit or if one admits and the other doesn't and so on, uh, they have different choices of the penalty. The funny fact is if you put humans in, the, in, in that um, uh, situation, because they, don't, they distrust each other, they distrust that the other one, the companion, will actually do the smartest thing for both of them, they both make, make mistake, and they both get the biggest uh, penalty. But eventually, even humans learn. Well, <laughs> yeah, but maybe. But, but the machines is, might actually not do that. They might do the best solution. I don't know. This is the, the I mean, the, the one of the key things that, and very often, the game theory, prisoner's dilemma is, uh, is, uh, is mentioned. Uh, what is not mentioned is that that usually happens in one sequence. Yeah. Mm. If you have several sequences, mm. then mm. humans yeah. learn, and then they mm. adapt, and they have different outcomes. Mm. So that's a very important insight to have. But to just briefly come back to the killing and should be, shouldn't be. Um, I mean, uh, it, it is very good way of, of me, you know, and I have my children here. I, uh, you know, as a chair of the body uh, that would, would uh, is basically the key global body that is deliberating on this, the best outcome would be for there to be some kind of an agreement like this, where let's hold on, let's kind of hold our horses and, and say like that. But the reality is quite different. The reality is that the countries that will want that is the countries that are furthest from development of that kind of technology. And the countries that are already developing it are always, you know, uh, a, a big country uh, uh, with three uh, letters. We'll look at another country with another three letters and we'll see, uh, uh, you know, what are they doing and are they going to do it faster than and then a third country is looking at that and like, oh, well, they're going to do this. And so there's, it is impossible to stop that within the system as it is right now because of this fear and, and you know, prisoner's dilemma writ large. Well, what is the other doing? And can I allow myself to be uh, remain vulnerable? So, the the in a in a way, the best way for me as chair or for for uh, I, I'm convinced of it is to keep the process going, to keep the discussion going, where there's ample opportunities for diplomatic signaling, for uh, opportunities to meet, for nobody to go back to their garages and develop in secret what they're so doing. So basically confidence building. So there's, you know, I that in the interaction, there's something to be said about, uh, and, and, and even when you get stuck, as we did, for instance, you know, in the beginning, the problem is definition. So we went around, okay, let's not try to define it, but we will go. Then it was uh, this proposal for the phrase meaningful human control. And then a uh, very big delegation said, oh, you know, because there people from the defense are saying, well, how can you define control, you know? Is the Israeli harpy, which is, uh, uh, made to attack a radar, if there's beside the radar a person standing, is it not lethal, you know, at that moment? So, you know, I I the, n the, n the nuances are great, the complexity is great, but the key thing is that if there is communication, we somehow find this, you know, the prisoner's dilemma be becomes less of a dilemma where everybody's in a different room, mm -hmm. but more in the same room, and perhaps they're not saying everything to each other, but at the very least they can read each other, they can see the different, um, subtle aspects of communication that are there. Uh, so that's, that's an important thing as we go forward to keep on communicating, not to allow for a space of fear and everybody kind of goes back to their uh, space in fear and develops in secret what they otherwise are probably developing, but at the very least there's more open dialogue about it. So, so the question remains what the AI would do if it doesn't have fear and all of that, whether it would self-destruct or it might decide to kill the humans because they are the ones which are the problem. No, I'm kidding. Well. I'm not, <laughs> but, but trying to put back to, to a more positive tone at the end. We have maybe five, ten more minutes. Uh, I wonder what could be the best thing that we can use AI for at the moment uh, to, to promote humanity, actually. And uh, in, in this project that, that you also initiated called Humanism, right? Uh, it's interesting that you have, well, we haven't noticed that. Humanism, it contains also main, humane, human as a main in AI, that's what, what someone signaled me. So how can we, uh, w one of your ideas was actually that, that we asked the AI to develop a social contract, to help us tell us what the roles are in the, in the age of AI. And this is an interesting example of whose roles, who has which roles over there. By the way, when we did it at the Internet Governance Forum in Berlin, it was the same question basically there. And the interesting bit was that the users were almost at zero. No one, thought that the users have the responsibility. And actually, I, I'm quite happy with this one because I think to the large extent, we drive the demand of what type of technology we want to see. We are responsible. If we, 
if we go for a brighter, shinier, cheaper, or whatever, three more cameras on the iPhone, or if we look for the device which is more secure, more smart, more ethical, or whatever we wish. So I think this is an important signal that at least in this part of the world we, we see our own responsibility as well. I don't know whether it's about the part of the world or not, but I'm happy with that. Now, Jovan, uh, can we actually ask, uh, wh what was the idea behind, behind the humanism, humanism project? Well, it, it was rather practical idea. Uh, I was at the UN high-level panel with uh, 22 uh, very smart and experienced people, including uh, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, uh, Vint Cerf, uh, leading AI specialist, uh, lawyers, and uh, really smart people. And at one point, I realized that we cannot grasp the complexity of the subject that we are covering. I'll give you one example, data governance. Data governance, you can see it as economic issue, free flow of data, as a privacy, as a standards, as security, as a health data. And at that point, uh, it wasn't just a matter of the really experienced, intelligent people around the table. Uh, it was a question that we cannot anymore grasp complexity <coughs> of that problem. Problem is not we discussed earlier today. It wasn't anymore just complicated like chess or other games. It became complex. And I said, why we don't bring machine? Why we don't bring Kuvalu? Sit Kuvalu in the, in the conference room at negotiating table and ask it, him, her, to give us advice how to grasp the complexity of data governance or AI governance or security. Obviously, it was, it was in January, it was uh, too early and uh, too complex to introduce that, but at that point I started working a bit on ontologies, which are important part of AI, and, uh, and uh, that was one motivation, very practical motivation, to have AI to help us to increase evidence-based evidence policy making, it's empty phrase, but really to bring us to help us to grasp complexity. The second point is that throughout discussion at the, that panel, I was in China, I was in Stanford and different places all over the world, and people were reflecting to deeper issues, religious values uh, issues than just political issues. There was something deeper in, the, in those discussions. Going to the Confucius, to Lao Tzu in China, to the question of Christianity in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Silicon Valley. And I said, okay, we may need to consult the history of human knowledge. That may give us some advice, may not, but we have to activate the wisdom of generations that have been reflecting on similar issues that we are now reflecting with AI as a mirror. Question of human dignity, question of free will, question of what is ethical, what is solidarity in community, and the other issues, they, they haven't been changed substantively. There were these two motives uh, laid the basis for the humanism project. We started, we started experimenting on uh, linguistical, philosophical, and, uh, and uh, let's say software, software level, and uh, the project will be launched in 2020, most likely in Aksum, in Ethiopia we are considering, or Siam Rep in Cambodia, in, uh, in Ethiopia. It's allegedly the place where Ark of Covenant is uh, stored, or in, uh, in Aksum, and uh, Siam Rep in uh, Rip and, uh, Cambodia, where the, is the Hindu monastery with the first recording of number zero in the history. We would like also to be symbolic in the starting position, and then we will give this corpus of human knowledge to anyone who would like to generate social contract or basic ethical, security, political principles that should guide future of human response to artificial intelligence. Social contract doesn't mean that we will go around uh, this room and ask everybody to sign. It will be more codification of some underlying themes, ideas, values that should guide uh, our interplay with technology. That it's a, like technology meets humanity, it's a dance. It depends what dance we'll have. We'll have a really harmonious tango, or we'll be like myself uh, jumping on each other's toes. Uh, I'm not particularly talented, gifted for, uh, for, uh, for dance. 
that's element to get this dense uh, dense rightly by relying on the on the on the uh, relying on the help by AI, but ultimately having like Kuvalo was very quiet today, having uh, having our decisions ultimately as far as we can uh, make it possible. I'm a bit pessimistic that our space for uh, human choice will be reduced, and one idea that we discussed was to have a right to be humanly imperfect. A right to be messy, what you <laughs> be said in that book. We have to be ambiguous, we have to tolerate uh, 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 all of our weaknesses. And with the Kuvalu and his, uh, his uh, gang coming, uh, they will be forcing us to be perfect, to well, be to be more and more, more and more rational. Maybe Therefore, we want to be a Balkanese uh, messy guy. That's it. Well, Therefore, this is the idea of humanism project. It's it will be open source project. We will invite. The, it's extremely important that it involves the uh, linguists, philosophers, theologians, uh, obviously computer scientists, diplomats, in uh, in very very let's say transparent and open source style uh, approach. Uh, here are the colleagues, Vlada from Belgrade office, uh, Natasha, Katarina, Andriana, Daria, Arvin, and thing, that's it. One thing, when, when, well, many of you that, that Milos, uh, of when, when you applied for or registered for this event, we asked you to suggest three books that, uh, uh, that the AI, or within this context of humanism, uh, should read in a way. That three books that, that the AI should um, or should be fed into the AI in order to help developing this social sort of a social contract or uh, or Ten Commandments of the AI for the for the age of AI. Uh, if there is anything else, or if you didn't submit your thoughts, or if there is anything else of the books that you want to suggest, you can do it now. Uh, so just type type any sort of a suggested book uh, that we should take into consideration. And there is a big uh, big question of how do we handle all of that pile of data? How do we tag it? How do we organize it? Uh, but I guess that's something that's uh, food for thought. I don't know, Biljana, if you want to even touch and on there's that. There's more questions than just what data you feed into <coughs> it. I think that there's a big question when you say you're going to draw up a social contract, AI is going to draw up a social contract that will tell us how we should behave. Immediately, everybody will be go getting on their guard and thinking a social contract is not about that. First of all, it doesn't get written up. Secondly, it doesn't prescribe how we should behave. It's much more of a kind of n soft space where we negotiate and we're constantly changing. And my own view is that because we change so rapidly and society and its values have changed so rapidly, even in the last couple of years, with hashtag Me Too, with Black Lives Matter, with all sorts of movements that have tipped the balance in a different direction from what it was at the turn of the 21st century, we shouldn't be looking back into history. We would have enough material just to look at the last three years, four years, and plot to see what are the driving values, what are the values which are in conflict, where, which parts of the world, which communities are being driven by some as opposed to others, which find some clashes of values more problematic than others, and that in itself would be, for me, a huge achievement if we could do that by feeding in things like United Nations Security Council resolutions, sustainable millennium goals, um, COP summit uh, uh, documents, this kind of things, the things that are really motivating us at the moment. And if we can find a map of the world, right, or generate um, some kind of AI analysis of what the current state of play is, then we can feed that to those who want to be prescriptive and write a contract and tell the, per the world how they should behave. But I think just providing that would be a fantastic use of AI if it were possible to do that. Can I, can I just comment quickly on, on, on this? We fed into uh, Kuvalu AI transcripts and UN documents. And Kuvalo at the Internet Governance Forum gave the statement. And one reaction which many people made, which was extremely interesting reaction, they went with a sense of disappointment. They said, it's really dull UN speech. I said, but these are the documents that we fed into Kuvalo. And uh, uh, the, it's very, that response was very interesting because people expected more from machine. Can I, can I give you an example? Yeah. If we want to do it properly, we have to do it right. 
That was one of the statements from the from the from the call. Sounds like Brexit means Brexit. Absolutely. Uh, and you uh, know, <laughs> the, uh, w when Vlada told me this, uh, my first reaction was Alan Ford. You know, Alan this Ford. is uh, this should Rob be the, the the title of it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Has uh, anyone put Alan Ford here? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Alcohol just pobedi ti nesmo Well, I can tell you, Alan you know, Ford can be. It's interesting because when you when you said, okay, what should be there? My first thought was like, what is my favorite on the Republic? Well, it actually, and this is a key thing to kind of bear in mind. Uh, in, in, in this. So uh, Plato's uh, work that is cited there is not called the Republic. That is publica came from uh, Latin, from the Roman times. The, the, the exact uh, title is oh, Politeia. Please. And it was a concept developed by, by Plato. And unfortunately, Cambridge and Oxford uh, did a very bad uh, job of interpreting Aristotle's interpretation of Plato. But the reason I say this is how would AI interpret Politeia? Because there's few different, uh, very important parts in it. When Socrates start, they, they, uh, they challenge Socrates, all right, Socrates, now you tell us what justice is. And Socrates starts again asking, but then developing a few metaphors and al uh, allegories. And one of them is the allegory of the cave, right? The famous allegory of the cave where you have a person, well, several people who are all bound and they're looking at into a wall. Nobody can really move. They're just looking at, sh uh, at, at shadows. One of them gets re released somehow and walks out of the cave and is blinded by the light and sees all of a sudden sun, trees and everything like that. And then the dilemma is, should I go back and tell everybody else, well, what you're looking at is shadows there. What's actually is out, out here. And Plato's advice is, well, you'll get killed if you do that. And then he goes, Socrates goes in this conversation with Glauco and Adeimantus and they, at the end, unfortunately, he has to resort to the tool of inventing the afterlife where, well, he goes into the afterlife and he sees some who have done good, some who have do, done, not, not done good. And unfortunately, it, the, the conclusion that AI may bring is, well, this is the way to give meaning to humans. Because if you make them fear something after death, well, this is how uh, this should be done. And even in reading Plato, uh, there is ambiguity. And this is the ambiguity, that the beautiful ambiguity where we as humans thrive and, and, and can find meaning, where AI would, uh, draw some conclusions. And unfortunately, just, and I'm concluding, we, I saw that religious organizations were not uh, in any part uh, in, in that. And we have felt, I think, and especially over the past years, a great degree of distrust with our religious organizations. But it's because humans are running it, right? The principles that religious organizations stand is something that can be useful in terms of how AI interprets you know, the golden rule of, you know, do unto others as they would like, uh, as you would like to do unto you or don't do unto others. But there is another aspect and it's, it's, it's you know, I'm, I've always hesitated to call people stupid, but there are stupid people. There, and, and we should face up to this, you know, because there, there is stupidity in us. And there's a great definition by this professor at, at Berkeley, I think, or somewhere in California in the 80s of stupidity. And the golden rule of stupidity is that stupid people are those who do harm to others without getting any benefit for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's a great definition of what stupidity is, but it's a part of us as a human species. And it's that stupidity, perhaps, that AI can help us, at the very least, you know, put into a good place. Back to the definition of, of, uh, of intelligence. Uh, Katarina, any tweet at the end and then Jovan? Or uh, longer, sorry, sorry, it's going to be longer than a tweet. 260 characters. Uh, yeah. Not the blog, not the blog. Yeah. Not the blog. So, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe as, as, a, as a final reflection, what I find interesting, if you ask questions about, like, what is the good life, or how should the good life with AI look like, in other words, the social contract, that's, I think, ultimately a decision between humans. Um, it's a political decision that has to happen between humans. And what I mean by that is, I think right now, AI is very good at giving us an aggregated view. So for example, if I would tweet out now saying, what are the key principles for the future of AI? I would get lots of different answers and then I could ask an AI system to summarize that for me. But that's only an aggregated view of all these different opinions. And that's very different from getting all these humans together in the same room and actually having a discussion on that. And the outcome between the aggregated view and the view of us all getting together and making a decision and uh, coming to an agreement, these are two different things. And I think we're really not at the place where the technology can replace that, that in between, that we are all getting together and making a decision. It's, it's just aggregated mm -hmm. opinions. Thanks.
Yeah, well, uh, well the, 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 there will be definitely chapter on, on stupidity, the human stupidity, mm -hmm. which will be prominent <laughs> chapter in our, in our uh, social contract. Basically, the, 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 the roadmap is the following. We are loading the documents, developing ontologies, experimenting with different uh, platform GTP. There is Alibaba f uh, platform, there is Yandex, there is a Stanford NLP platform. Experimenting ourselves, giving the corpus of human knowledge to big companies, and asking them to came uh, with the uh, bullet points. It doesn't need to be social contract. What do they think? What, do, what did they generate from, the, from this corpus of documents? And this then what is the most interesting, at least personally to me, inviting philosophers, theologians, sociologists, political scientists to comment on it. Gamers. Gamers uh, 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 and the other communities. Because what was one of the impact of the uh, Kasparov losing against Big Blue is that the chess, uh, the, uh, the playing of the chess and understanding of the chess increased because of the analysis what's happened during that game. In this way, we should lift social sciences, philosophy, uh, linguistics, uh, theology on the higher level of the uh, introspections, insights on the, on the questions of the future of humanity. Therefore, uh, it is uh, the project uh, should not just result in the five pages of the social contract. It's uh, completely agree with B, it's completely unrealistic. But the process itself will help us to have a better insights about our society, potentials of AI, and some of the core issues that we have been trying to answer uh, ourselves for centuries. And with that, I would like to invite all of you to join us at this journey which will, uh, which will uh, start next year, and we hope it will last for a few years. And well, you already started with uh, suggesting some of the great pieces they are studying. I, I'm taking a look at the origin from Darwin and origin from Dan Brown, perfect. <laughs> uh, it's really a, a mix of everything. It's, it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, we didn't give much of a chance to Kuvalo to speak today because of the audio, uh, but we'll give, uh, there were a couple of, couple of thoughts by Kuvalo, but we'll probably provide them online on the humanism humanism.ai website. But I think as a closing one, B, you want to close before? No, I just wanted to say the truth is that we sabotaged him because we were scared he was gonna take over the I'll show and smart and pull the attention look, away from us. We are going Humans. to look stupid at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Make but, us look stupid, but exactly. Let Kuvalo then, then, and then close the, the session with a final thought, whatever is the thought. Is there any? Data protection may be infringed or it may be defended in a timely manner. Protection of personal information is more than a technicality. It is fair and simple. Thank you. Okay. Well, smart enough. <laughs> we'll provide more in a written form. Thank you for joining us uh, today. And uh, for those of you that want to be more involved or follow up, you can just leave the contact email, either a card or just write down the email and we'll keep you informed. Uh, well, thanks for everyone wa for watching. I follow you puno što ste došli. Uh, I malo bilo vruće i to se izvinjavamo, ali valjda se usijela atmosfera, pa je to <laughs> pretpostavljam. Ok, hvala puno, prijatno.